Good evening, everyone. I'm Peter Jacob. I'm the chief curator of the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to A Silent Night, a World War I Memorial and Song. This is the final program in the museum's four-year observance of the centenary of World War I. Since 2014, we have mounted education programs, an art exhibition, a film series, concerts, and other public outreach to shed light on the world-changing events of a century ago, and also to bring understanding and perspective of the First World War for our own time. It's been the Air and Space Museum's pleasure to partner with the National Museum of American History on several of these projects, including this evening's concert. So I thank my colleagues here at American History for making this splendid venue available for tonight's performance. I would also like to thank, uh, pardon me, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank Javier Arango and the Arango family for their generous support of our entire World War I centenary program. Javier was passionate about preserving and understanding the history of World War I aviation, and he was a wonderful partner and supporter of the National Air and Space Museum for many years. Sadly, we lost Javier not long ago, but his legacy lives on in many ways. Tonight's concert and the entire World War I centenary program is a tribute to Javier's legacy. Several members of the Arango family had planned to be with us tonight, but they were unable to come to Washington at the last minute. But I understand they are watching uh, the broadcast from their home in California. So to the Arangos online from the nation's capital, we thank you so much for making this and all the World War I centenary events possible. I know Javier's spirit is here with us for this culminating program. I would also like to take this opportunity to recognize a great friend and colleague who also recently left us. Margaret Vining was a curator here at American History for more than 30 years in the Division of Armed Forces History. World War I was a research and collecting area of particular interest of hers, especially with regard to the role of women in the First World War. She also contributed significantly to our World War I centenary program. The Smithsonian's collections and archives with regard to women in the military and their work in support of the military are vastly richer for her efforts. I'd like to take this opportunity to pay tribute to Margaret's great legacy and her contribution to the World War I centenary observance. And now for this evening's program, A Silent Night, A World War I Memorial and Song. You're about to experience an extraordinary musical journey back to World War I through the songs and composers of the period. John Brancy and Peter Dugan have crafted a stirring repertoire that captures the sensibilities of the time and enriches the soul, our soul today. This concert is a telling example of how art and music can bring a unique perspective to history and engaging with our past. I guarantee you will leave enlightened and moved by what you hear. And now, with great pleasure, I give you John Brancy, Peter Dugan, and a, night, a Silent Night, a World War I Memorial and Song.
worked us out at sea, just as before you went below. The world is as it used to be. All nations striving strong to make red war yet redder. Christ's sake, than you were helpless in such matters. And this is not the judgment hour for some of them's a blessed thing, or if it were, they'd have to scoff and slough for so much threatening. Stuck to pipes and me. Again, the gods disturbed the hour, roaring their readiness. Good evening, everyone. Yes, thank you for coming tonight, and thank you to uh, both the Smithsonian Institute, uh, American History Museum, and the Air and Space Museum. And Peter, thank you for having us here.
And also, hello to those of you who are joining remotely uh, over the live stream. Thank you all for tuning in. Um, 100 years ago tomorrow, World War I came to an end after more than four years of unthinkable destruction, the likes of which the world had never seen before. Um, the piece you just heard, that poetry was written by Thomas Hardy, actually a few months before the outbreak of World War I. So ironic that he created this description of endless, senseless war uh, right before that moment in history. It was almost prophetic. Uh, and the music was actually set uh, just before the outbreak of World War II uh, by Gerald Finzi. So we thought that piece would be a great opener to just think about how these kinds of themes we're going to be exploring tonight in a way are truly timeless and resonate all the way back to Stonehenge, as, as John just sang. And the next composer who we're going to feature, his name is George Butterworth. George Butterworth died in the Battle of the Somme at the age of 31 years old. He wrote these songs just before the outbreak of World War I as well. And they almost tell of a sort of prophetic story of George Butterworth's own life. Yeah, and especially the last two songs which describe uh, young men whose lives end tragically too soon. Um, which was, of course, the case for George Butterworth and so many others. Um, we hope you enjoy. Oh, we should mention, because you have translations for the foreign language songs, which will come up later, um, the poetry that you're about to hear from Butterworth is A.E. Hausman. of trees the cherry now will song with bloom along the boughs and stands about the woodland When I was one and twenty, I heard a wise man say, Give crowns and pounds and guineas, but not your heart away. Give pearls away and rubies, but keep your fancy free. But I was one and twenty, no use to talk to me. When I was one and twenty, I heard him say again, the heart out of the bosom was never given in vain. 
Tis paid with sighs of plenty and sold for endless food. And I am two and twenty, and oh, tis true, tis true, tis true. Look not in my eyes for fear they mirror true the sight I see and there you find your face too clear and love it and be lost like me one the long nights through must lie spent in starved feed and sighs but why should you Charlie, why should men make haste to die? Empty heads and tongues and talking make the rough road easy walking. And the feather paint of folly bears the falling sky. Oh, tis jesting, dancing, drinking speeds the heavy world around. If young hearts were not so clever, oh, they would be young forever. Think no more, tis only thinking, lays lads underground. Think no more, lad, laugh be jolly, why should men make haste to die? Empty heads and tongues are talking, make the rough road easy walking. For the paint of folly burns the falling sky. The lads in their hundreds to Ludlow come in for the fair. There's men from the barn and the forge and the mill and the fold. The lads for the girls and the lads for the liquor are there, and there with the rest are the lads that will never be old. There's chaps from the town and the field and the till and the cart, and many to count of the stalwart and many the brave, and many the handsome of face, and the handsome of heart, and few that will carry their looks or their truth to the grave. I wish one could know them, I wish there were tokens to tell, the fortunate fellows that now you can never discern, and then one could talk with them friendly and wish them farewell and watch them depart on the way that they will not 
Ever Gurney, another English composer who fought in World War I. He did survive, but it was a very, very difficult experience for him. He was shot first where he was wounded, and then he was sent back to the front, and at which point he also experienced poison gas. And he wrote one of these songs while he was in a trench by a beer side. After the war, he continued to compose music and continued to write poetry, uh, but he did so in and out of his insane asylums where he spent the rest of his days. Uh, at the time, it was thought of as shell shock. Um, now we, we know that as PTSD. Um, these songs are haunting, especially the second one that John mentioned was written in the trench, and you can actually hear the way he captures the sounds in and puts them into the piano at the very end of that second song. Listen for the, the way the piano evokes the, the sound of artillery fire. Sick for my hills again, my hills again. To see upon the seven plain unscabbarded against the sky. Jagged Malvern with a train of shadows. Where the land is low, like a huge imprisoning. a sacred city built of marvelous earth life was lived nobly there to give such beauty birth beauty was in that heart and in that eager Drifts the 
stall for him. Um, we, we go now to Germany. So at this point, if you have the translations for uh, the German songs, you're welcome to use them or not use them if you prefer to just experience it. Um, these are four songs by um, Orff, who is best known for Carmina Burana, but actually served in World War I with the Germans at the age of 18 or 19 and a trench collapsed on him and he was wounded. Um, he, these pieces are interesting stylistically in that they're very, very different from what was going on with the English composers that you just heard. Uh, World War I was a time when nationalism in music was really becoming um, even more polarized than it already had been. So as we journey from one country to the next tonight, you'll hear four very distinct styles. Um, with this particular set of four songs, the two pieces in the middle uh, harken back to the romanticism of 19th century uh, Germanic composers, uh, whereas the pieces on the outer sides, the first piece and the fourth piece, are very different, very bombastic, um, almost, almost terrifying to, to witness these, these some of these pieces. So I uh, hope you enjoy. Das Regiment der Sterne erhält die Welt wie einer Nuss in Fäusten. Unsterblich schließt sich Lachen um sein Antlitz. Krieg ist sein Wesen und Triumph sein Schritt. Und wo er ist und seine Hände breitet, Oh, 
den Teufel nun das goldene Glied, ein verspielter Engel. Thank you. Thank you, and welcome back to those of you joining online. Um, we are going to start the second half with France with some really serious heavy hitters, uh, Ravel, Poulenc, and Debussy. Ravel drove an ambulance in World War I. Poulenc served in both World Wars, actually. He was only a teenager when he served in World War I. And Debussy, although he didn't serve, he was, he was too old at that time, he actually wrote, uh, this piece is his final composition that he ever composed, and it's his own poetry, uh, sort of a condemnation, well, not sort of, a very strong condemnation of war um, and also calling for vengeance. Uh, before we get there, I just want to say a word about the other pieces. Ravel, is, we're going to open with a prelude from the Tombeau de Couperin, which he dedicated each movement to a different friend of his who died in the war. Then we'll go to the three beautiful birds of paradise, uh, one red, one white, and one blue, not because of the colors of the American flag, but because of the colors of the French flag. <laughs> and um, then we go to uh, Bluet, with a very beautiful poem written by Apollinaire, who died in World War I. And this, uh, this poem talks about how War, World War I affected an entire generation of young people. Totally changed the way people viewed what it even means to live and die. Uh, then we'll have a very touching prayer for peace, which Poulenc wrote actually, again, on the verge of World War II, um, making it that much more haunting when we think about this prayer for peace. And finally, uh, the Debussy, which I already mentioned. So. Hope you enjoy this trip through France 100 years ago.
Finally, the United States, of course, entered the war late compared to the other countries you've heard from, uh, 19 April of 1917, and that's exactly when these three songs, which you're going to hear, were written. This first song, uh, The Things Our Fathers Loved, talks about how these tunes that we, that we hear sort of live on forever in our souls. And Charles Ives, uh, one of the most iconic composers of the early 20th century, American composers, he wrote band tunes into a lot of the songs, and, and a lot of the, the songs that were the, the songs that we're going to perform tonight actually hold some some band to band tunes that you can listen for. Yeah, in fact, uh, the second piece we're going to do um, in Flanders Fields, which by the way is why John and I are wearing poppies. Uh, this poem was written by a Canadian. Uh, doctor who was serving, and when he he w observed uh, at the burial of, of a friend of his, how quickly these red poppies started to grow over the, the tombs, and he in inspired in that moment, he composed this poem, which became really an international sensation, and it was an American uh, professor, actually, a fem yeah, she came up with the idea to after the war was over, to wear a poppy as a sign of remembrance uh, based on that, on that poem. And of course, since then, the tradition has sort of been lost a bit here in the United States, but it it's still lives on very much so in, in the Commonwealth countries. So Peter and I are actually going to be performing at the Kennedy Center on Monday, but it's our second performance, or sorry, our second program called Armistice, The Journey Home. And Peter's brother uh, is a composer, and we're going to be featuring a new treatment of the, uh, the poem in Flanders Fields. And it, it will receive his world premiere on Monday at the Kennedy Center. And that was actually commissioned by the government of Flanders, so we're very Indeed. excited yeah. to, to be doing that. Thank you. We can't do it. We can't do it tonight. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. The world premiere has to be then. But we are going to do the Charles Ives version, which was written back in 1917. 
And actually, in that song, you'll hear in the piano part the entirety of My Country, Tis of Thee, uh, about halfway through. Listen for that in the piano. Listen for Over There, which will appear in the Tom Sails Away, which Charles Eyes actually also wrote the text to, uh, to Tom Sails Away as well. Yeah.
distress. So we gave our glorious laddies, Father made us do no less. For no gallant son of Britain to a foreign yoke shall man, and no English man is silent to the same. is a book that we study. Some of its leaves bring a sigh. There it was written, my buddy, that we must part you and I. Nights are long since you went away. I think about you all through the day. My buddy, my buddy, nobody quite so true. Miss your voice, the touch of your hand, just to long to know that you understand my buddy, my buddy, your buddy misses you. Thank you. 
So oh. 